you to turn in your Bible to Exodus chapter 35. And I'll give you this uh, little warning. Well, not warning. Last week I talked about blood, right? And it was like, oh no. It's gonna... Today we're going to talk about uh, sea cow hides. So you're like, what has this guy been doing? But anyways, it, not, not fully, but it's in there. So this passage in Exodus chapter 35, and we're going to start at verse 4. And we're going to read the first uh, till the end of it. And then we'll carry on with chapter 6, a few verses there. So uh, bear with me. So this is now the, the people of Israel have, have escaped. They've exited Egypt where they were enslaved for 420, 30 years. And so they've been wandering in the, in the wilderness, and yet now God is inviting them and calling them to, to a, be forming a worship community. And part of that is setting up this, this tabernacle, this tent, that they can take with them wherever they go in their wandering, and they can set it up for as long as, as the Lord wants them to be in that location. And so this is some of the details of what it means, or what it meant for them to form this, this, build this tabernacle. All right? So here we go. Mark, or not Mark, Exodus 35, verse 4. Here we go. Moses, Moses said to the whole Israelite community, this is what the Lord has commanded. From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing is to bring to the Lord an offering of gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, ram skins dyed red, and another type of durable leather, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for fragrant incense, and onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastpiece. All who are skilled among you are to come and make everything the Lord has commanded. The tabernacle with its tent and its covering, clasps, frames, crossbars, posts, and bases, the ark with its poles and atonement cover and the curtain that shields it, the table with its poles and all its articles and the bread of the presence, the lampstand that is for light with its accessories, Lamps and oil for the light, the altar of incense with its poles, the anointing oil and fragrant incense, the curtain for the doorway at the entrance to the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with its bronze grating, its poles and all its utensils, the bronze basin with its stand, the curtains of the courtyard with its posts and bases, and the curtain for the entrance to the courtyard the tent pegs for the tabernacle and for the courtyard and their ropes, the woven garments worn for ministering in the sanctuary, both the sacred garments for Aaron the priest and the garments for his sons when they serve as priests. Verse 20. Then the whole Israelite community withdrew from Moses' presence, and everyone who was willing and whose heart moved them came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of meeting, for all its service and for the sacred garments. All who were willing, men and women alike, came and brought gold jewelry of all kinds, brooches, earrings, rings, and ornaments. They all presented their gold as a wave offering to the Lord. Everyone who had blue, purple, or scarlet yarn, or fine linen, or goat hair, ram skins dyed red, or the other durable leather brought them. Those presenting an offering of silver or bronze brought it as an offering to the Lord. And everyone who had acacia wood for any part of the work brought it. Every skilled woman spun with her hands and brought what she had spun, blue, purple, or scarlet yarn or fine linen. And all the women who were willing and had the skill spun the goat hair. The leaders brought onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastpiece. They also brought spices and olive oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. All the Israelite men and women who were willing brought to the Lord freewill offerings for all the work the Lord through Moses had commanded them to do. Then Moses said to the Israelites, See, the Lord has chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah, And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills, 
to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of artistic crafts. And he has given both him and Oliab, son of Asimach, for, of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach others. He has filled them with skill to do all kind of work, all kinds of work as engravers, designers, embroiderers in blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine linen, and weavers, all of them skilled workers and designers. Whew. It's a good long passage there. Now, again, this is this is building of the tabernacle, putting this all together, and it says very clearly, the Lord is, is asking the people to bring things, to bring what they have. It wasn't like they're out in the middle of the desert and they say, hey, we're out of acacia wood, let's, let's go down, you know, to, to the lumber yard and, and get some, or, you know, we need some spices or anointing oil, let's, let's go to winners or anything like that. It was, it was what the people had and what they would, would offer. Now, we don't understand, looking back in, in some ways, of all the things that were required. There's some people, some scholars, they love this stuff, all the stuff about the tabernacle. And, and they love putting together all the pieces. When I was a, a kid at the Bible camp that I grew up, we had a, a, a couple that came, and they were our camp speakers. And they actually had an actual size tabernacle that they set up in our, in our field. And at first it was kind of like, well, you're taking up our, our field for this. And then we realized that it actually wasn't very big. Some, for some reason we think the tabernacle was this massive thing. But actually when we saw it life size, it was like, this isn't actually a very big, big tent. Uh, but it was, it was very interesting to see all the details and everything that was put in place for a specific purpose. And you've got a handout there that's got some blanks if you want to fill or follow along. But that's the, the first point I just want to make as we draw some principles out of this passage. Again, when we come to God's word, we realize that a part of our interpretive um, idea of, of how we understand scriptures, we have to look at it and say, is this a descriptive passage or prescriptive? That's a key thing to know when we come to, to a part of scripture. And so is it descriptive? Is it describing what is happening? Or is it prescriptive, meaning that it is for us today? Is it a command? Is it something that we are to follow today? And in some cases, it can be kind of both. But we, that's part of the work of the big word of hermeneutics or interpretation of Scripture. We've got to be good students of the word. All right? So our, our plan today, if, if we were to read this and we go to Exodus 35, our our from God, it's not that we should read this and say, oh, we got to build a tabernacle. You know, we've got a nice grassy area back there. We've got some bouncy castles back there. We could probably fit that tabernacle back there and, and do all these things. Well, no, we don't. It was describing a particular time, particular season as, as God was forming his people, Israel. We don't go back to that and say we need to do it again. So it's descriptive, all right? It's not prescriptive for us today. But we do draw principles from this, from God's word, and these are some of the things that I want to just point out. So first of all, we see that everything had a purpose. Everything had a purpose. We don't go back and understand. It's probably 3,500 years ago that this was happening. We don't even know all of the, the, what was the purpose of all these things. But you see in what I read that there was these things. This anointing oil was for this. This curtain was for this. It was very clear. God gave very clear instructions. And we see that he, God did that when, you know, Noah was making an ark. We see this later on when uh, David, Solomon, they were building the temple, right? It was, there was very clear details and things that we don't always go, okay, why, what was the matter of the details? But we see that God is a God of purpose. He had a purpose behind it all. In verse 7, this is what I was talking about, these sea cow hides. Your Bible, how many of you have a Bible and it says sea cow hides? Some of you? All right, there's other words. It's like there's a dugong or dugon, gong or something like that. I don't know what it is. It's, it's kind of a strange thing, and that's why in this translation that I read, it said another form of durable leather. Because <laughs> it's like, I don't know what that is. So, but it seems like it was some sort of an aquatic animal uh, maybe your note has that at the bottom, and it's just they had durable leather hides. And, and we don't know, but it, w it was a really good covering for, for the tabernacle. 
Um, so whether it was a sea cow hide, uh, some people thought it was like badger skins or something like that. I mean, probably took a bunch of those. Um, porpoises, there's all kinds of things that go, what is this? We don't know. Some of the details aren't necessarily clear for us to understand. But we see this, and this is the point, is that God had a, had a very clear design. And he, he was a God, he is a God of, of purpose. Everything down to the smallest measurement was given for instruction for the people. Now, we have more, and as Tanya mentioned, the Bible is a big book, and so we have to look at it in terms of what we have now in the New Testament. And we see in the book of Hebrews this picture of the tabernacle and, and how Jesus is a, is a fulfillment of that, that it was a foreshadowing of what Jesus brought. And it, it says in, in the book of Hebrews how this foreshadowing that Jesus entered the tabernacle not by means of blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. And so it was a picture, it was a foreshadowing of what he ultimately would do and accomplished. Now, this group of people, the, the Israelites, they, this was a nomadic bunch of people, right, wandering around. And so God was creating with them, within them, a people, but also a, a culture of worship, a culture of, of worship. And so we think about us today at College Drive. What is the culture of worship that we are, we are creating here? What do we do in terms of our, our ministries, the things that you saw up here? What do we do in terms of our facilities? What do we do in terms of our budget that's, that's serving a purpose? Because we continue to have the purpose of God. We have a purposeful God. And he wants us to be about his purposes. So we, we are seeking to create that culture of worship still and to serve the mission. And the mission that we declare clearly here is that we are to be and make disciples of Jesus. And we believe that the church is God's plan, plan A. There isn't a, a plan B. And so we are a part of that. But it would be very clear that the church is not this building Right? We go to College Drive Community Church, we think of, oh, that's that location, that's that spot near Lethbridge College. But, but the church is not the building. The church is the people, and it's you, and it's me. And this is what God is doing and c continuing to call us to his purposes. All that we do should be in alignment with our purpose to be and make disciples and to create that that culture of worship here among us and we invite you into that this is not something that we do just as an organizational statement to be and make disciples it should be something that we individually we each own the statement underneath that in that point there is that do you know your, your PLM, your, your personal life mission? You'll hear about it as we turn the calendar over into the new year, um, Lord willing. And we'll, we do a, a six-week course. It's called our Exploring Leadership course. And a bunch of you have gone through that. And in that course, we, we talk very clearly about your purpose in life. Because it's hard to lead people. It's hard to be a leader if you don't yourself know where you're going. If you don't know your own purpose and each of us has a, a purpose and so do you know could you articulate why you exist could you do that see God is a God of purpose and he has a purpose for the church for this church this body and he has a purpose for you for your life and so I want to encourage you and challenge you if, if that's something that um, sort of allows you to, to you know that to percolate into your mind to say, what is my purpose? What is my, what is my mission? That you would explore that. You would take some time in this fall, despite kind of the busyness of the season, to say, what, what am I about? What is my life mission? God is a God of purpose, and he wants relationship with me and to give me his purpose. Can I describe it? Can I move in that direction? Everything has a purpose, and so do you. All right, secondly, we see in this passage that everyone's gifts and abilities were from God for his purposes. 
Again, we read this in verse 30. It says, See, the Lord has chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur. I'm going to say these names again? Okay. Of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills to do all these creative things. It says they came from God. Do you acknowledge that today, that your skills, your abilities, your gifts are from God and they're for his purposes? It says he filled them with the skill to do it. They were filled with the Spirit of God. It was a unique ability, a a unique empowering for a task in the Old Testament was when the Spirit filled them. Now we know, as we look at the book of Acts, we see that, that the coming of the Holy Spirit meant something new, something different. We would actually be filled with the Spirit and, it would, and the Spirit would remain and continue to empower us and gift us. And it's not for us. It's for the church to edify the body. Do you know that what you have, what you can do, who you are, is not just for you. It's for the body. It's very clear throughout Scripture. What you have is not simply for you, to build your own kingdom. God has given you abilities and gifts that we need here in this body. It may be for one of the ministries listed or, or something that you've, you've heard about, you've seen. Maybe it's something that we haven't even thought of and you say, you know what, I, I can't necessarily, I don't know if I, I want to be an usher or I, if I'm, I'm good at like baking or, or leading Bible studies or anything. All those things, I don't know if that's my gifting or ability. Maybe something that just, just pops out of your mind. So I could do this, I could bring this. We want to be open to that and seeing how God could, could bring about new ministries or new ideas to the body that would, would serve the body but also reach people for Jesus. So how do you see your gifts, your talents and abilities being used for God right now? Thirdly, we see that everyone who was willing... We see this over and over again in this passage. It's probably what caught me originally when I read this. I, I highlighted that over and over again. It said, those who were willing. It says those, in verse 20, those whose hearts had, had moved them. You know, the gifts out of duty or compulsion were not offered. And when you think of the term offering, that's exactly what it is, an offering. It's, 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 it's giving. This is what I have. This is what I give. And so I want to ask you today, is, is your heart being, being moved to, to serve and to give? Are you willing? I think in my head sometimes there's, you know, people, maybe it's my sometimes a negative way of, of looking at things, sadly. Uh, I shouldn't be this way. But I think, man, I wonder if people just stay away from kickoff Sunday for a reason. Because <laughs> they know, oh, man, they're going to be, we're going to talk about ministries. And we're going to talk about all the needs that we have as a church. And it's like, oh, I'm going to just stay away. That's probably not. And it's not you. At least you, were, you didn't think about that or you didn't know that that was happening today. But sometimes I think, well, you know, I'm just going to stay away. If people, st- I'm going to stay away until sort of things get settled. I'll, I'll wait quietly until someone else steps up to serve, and then I, I won't have to. Or you just have a fear. That's one of the things why we do the, the, the exploring leadership class that we do, is just not so that you're going to you know, be necessarily a, uh, on our elders board or lead a ministry, but just that you have confidence to say, I could, I could be a part of a ministry, and I can, I can serve, and I can give and lead how God would want me to do. So some of you might be feeling, even as I mentioned, like a, a sense of duty or, or guilt right now. And that's truly the farthest thing from my desire. The last thing that I would want, and I think that God would want for you, is for you to get this feeling like to serve the church under a, a guilt, you know, man-induced guilt feeling. But if God is pressing on your heart and compelling you to, to join us here at College Drive for his purpose then I think you need to be faithful to that and you need to respond to that and ask some questions about that, what that could mean. We also invite you to give as financially as, as part of your service and your worship because we believe that everything that we have is God's. 
for his purposes. And we frame it, we often, I'll, I'll say it, I'll probably say it today. If I don't, you'll hear it now. But if giving is a part of your worship, it's, it's part of who you are, and that's what worship is, is saying, this is who I am, and I'm offering it. And what do you do with an offering? You, you offer it because you're willing. You're not doing it out of guilt or compulsion. And so we invite you to serve, not just, not just volunteer, but you know, serving is a response to the goodness of God in our lives. And our desire to partner with God in, in building his kingdom. And so when you do that, there is a, there's a blessing. There is joy in that. And being a part of something, too, that's bigger than, than yourself and what God wants for you. But I'll say this. One thing is, is if this is a season of life for you where you're struggling man, with, with health, with finances, with maybe a personal thing or in your marriage, and you honestly don't know what you have to give, and I'd say this, allow the ministry of the Lord and the church to sustain you and to bring blessing and healing to your life right now. You know, this is a, a team game, going back to my sports analogies, but it is a, it's being a part of a team. It's not to be a spectator, but sometimes even as part of a team, you need to sub out. You need to sub out for a bit and allow God to bring some healing and restoration to your life or deal with some things, some issues in your life that you need to address. And that's okay. The only thing I'd say with that is just don't withdraw from the team. And also look for even small ways where you can still be a part of the body. And it could also be part of your, the re-strengthening and healing in your life to do that. Okay, finally, get this. Everyone was told to stop giving because there was more than enough. Okay, here we go, chapter 6. We'll close with this part. So Bezalel, Oliah, Ohal, yeah, that guy, and every skilled person to whom the Lord has given skill and ability to know how to carry out all the work of constructing the sanctuary are to do the work just as the Lord commanded. Then Moses summoned Bezalel and Oholiab, and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability and who was willing to come and do the work. They received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning. So all the skilled workers who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing, and they said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord has commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order, and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more, because they, what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. I don't know about you, but I just, I wrote a big wow beside that in my Bible. Like, stop, please. Like, stop. We can't, we can't take any more. All right? It's just, it's piling up. We, we can't keep up. Like, will you please just stop being generous? Have you ever heard that in a church in your life? <laughs> yeah. I think, man, what a work of God. And you know why? It was because people were willing because their hearts were moved to be about the purposes of God. Well, what could that look like for us here at College Drive? Would you want to be a part of that? I, I read about one church. They were saying that their kids' ministry, and I'll just pick on that because I know that is a need for us. But um, this kids' ministry, it was so vibrant. It was so, like, passionate. People loved being involved in, in seeing kids come to Jesus and grow in their faith. That there was a waiting list for people to serve in the ministry. And I was going, that's wrong. That's wrong. Can you, you send them to another church then? I mean, why would you say I'm going to sit on this waiting list for two years until I can serve in the ministry? Like, find another ministry, right? Or go to another church where they don't. But anyways, I thought it was just like, wow. Wow. Like, what if, what if the resources that we had would just be so overwhelming that we just like um maybe maybe we just need to what could we do how many more missionaries and local partners like could we bless with more if we had it 
how many other things could, not just to do more things, but how could we be about the purposes of God in a way that would just, would just radiate throughout our community because of our generosity? Anyways, hear this invitation to you uh, today. Join us. Join in. The church is not a spectator sport. Our friend Ken Issa always says that. Um, and you know what? It'll, it'll require an investment of your time and your resources. But wow, is it, is it worth it? And know that it is, is for God. It's always for his purpose and always ultimately for his glory. Let's pray. Lord, again, we, we are thankful for our, our church, for the people here, the generosity, the capable leaders that we have and the, the servants that we have. And we pray that that would multiply. And we pray as we respond just to your invitation today, would you create an enthusiasm, not something that would just be a, a little, I don't know, a spark that would just fade as we leave and go have a hot dog and stuff, but something that would say, I want to be plugged into the ministry of this church, and I want to serve and give. Uh, Lord, uh, we thank you. We love you. We're thankful for Jesus who gave it all for us. Amen.